So um, Hillary and I have been talking quite a bit and uh, just around different things relating to extinction and neuroscience and um, parenting and all sorts of things. And um, I told her we should do like a Friday night hangout to kind of dive in a little bit more on some of the extinction stuff, because I was in a few months ago, we did with a few different panelists, a little bit on extinction, but it wasn't a very long period of time. So the point for tonight is to go over some information and then sort of chat and like have drinks. If you drink, um, feel free to grab one because uh, it's Friday night and just sort of hang out and, um, and share thoughts with one another. But I wanted to show these slides first, just to kind of get everyone on the same page. So the information that I'm presenting on these slides is something that some of you have already seen if you've attended any conferences I've presented at recently. Um, but otherwise, the um, information may be new to you. I don't know. We'll see. It is pretty interactive. That's why we titled this the experiential thing. The, PowerPoint does not match the title of the Zoom because it's a different presentation, but it was easier to just do this. So I am doing the short version of this, which means it should be 30 to 45 minutes, but we'll see how that goes. And um, and I have, I'm planning a longer version of this content where it'll be more like a workshop that's gonna be like five to six hours long. I just haven't figured out when I'm gonna do it. And within that, uh, we'll be doing like breakout rooms and practicing actually applying the information that I'm going to talk about today. The information in here is not specific to the PFA SBT process, but it's information that I wanted to share with you all to hopefully help improve um, how you're using the PFA and SBT process. And then Hillary will kind of chime in and tie things in there. And of course, anyone else that's watching, if they would like to, to tie things in as well, they can do that. So we'll go ahead and get started. So the first thing we're going to talk about is building relationships. This is, um, again, a short version of this. So this is one video I picked to show. This is me with a little guy um, about 13 years ago now. <laughs> I had to do some math. And um, I'm with one of my, so this was one of my grad students at the time, Claire. And we're working on just connecting with this little guy. So I'm going to show you the video and then I'll do like a little bit of a debrief on it. Okay, so a few things I want you to notice in this video. One, um, this little guy, he really could have cared less that we existed. <laughs> um, so the little tiny bit of interaction that we were able to get with him in the beanbag of just even staying in the beanbag with us and like having this back and forth was really big. You can see that um, when we're working on connecting with him, we're doing something that we know he likes, which is the up and down thing. But then um, Claire, who's my more creative counterpart, is doing this, like starts to do this like push and pull thing, which he does, he's not really that into. But we're just trying to play around and see, you know, what kinds of things does he like to do. With this little guy, we spent a lot of time working on just interacting in this way. His free operant responding was pretty much like he would just sit in a chair and look at phone books, or he liked to look at logos, which there's nothing wrong with, but like in terms of connecting pe with people in his environment, like he was literally like oblivious to the fact that we existed. So this is definitely a type of learner where if, um, if you have any clients that kind of fit this similar profile, if I could go back to that 13 years ago, that's like all we would have been doing is working on building a relationship with him and just really connecting and growing that interaction with him. 
we spent probably it was about 50 50 we spent about 50 percent of the time working on like those play activities and then we were still doing a lot of like traditional um, direct instruction type activities and he made progress but not nearly as much as he would have had we just focused on building a relationship first um the other thing of course that's important here is it's kind of difficult to tell what his HRE is, right? Like his happy, relaxed and engaged, there's like a little tiny bit of a smile, but he's not really that expressive. Um, so for us, that was like definitely HRE just based on knowing his, his just his, uh, how he engaged with the environment, even when he had like his phone books or his logos and stuff like that, that was about the highest amount of expression you were gonna get out of him. And then of course the, um, sort of shift in HRE when he goes to get out of the beanbag, right? He's done with it, <laughs> but it's not like any sort of dramatic response or anything. He just sort of sits up and then it's like, okay, that's our signal that we need to move on to something else, right? So I wanted to show this video as well because it kind of highlights that, you know, some of the learners we're working with, your uh, measuring of and like attending to their HRE is not necessarily it's, it might be very subtle. And even like the stress responses or like knowing that there's an EO um, push pressed in place might also be very subtle. So you have to be really cued in on what you're looking for with the learner. And then the last reason I had this in here, which I've already kind of talked about is just, you know, he, he got up and we let him get up, right? <laughs> like we're not gonna make him stay in the beanbag and try to like keep playing with us. All right, so why did I wanna start with, talking about relationships. For me, it's the first thing you have to focus on. If you're not attending to, to capturing motivation and building like a really trusting connected relationship with your learner, it doesn't matter if you're using PFA and SBT or any other intervention, you're not going to be as effective or make as much progress with your learner. And that's both from my own practical knowledge and experience base and then also um, especially in research outside of behavior analysis, the emphasis on how important it is to have like a trusting connected relationship between the, the therapeutic person, whether it's a behavior analyst or a teacher or a counselor and the client is huge. Like when that's not present, you're not as effective. Um, there, there's, you'd be hard pressed to find any research to show anything other than that. So if you're working with learners where you're having a hard time even gauging like how to get HRE. I see quite a few posts in the group where people are kind of talking about that, like um, their learner isn't necessarily hitting an HRE point, but they're pushing through on the skills-based treatment. And that to me is like not probably what I would do. I'd be focusing more on just like, we need to be, <laughs> you know, getting this situation with HRE first and not even attending to the skills-based treatment part yet, or even the PFA. Because if you can't um, have a pretty good amount of time in HRE with your learner and really understand what that is for them, your PFA and SBT process is probably not gonna be as effective. Again, based on my own practitioner experience, I don't think there's been any studies published on that yet, although that would be an interesting area of research. Um, Hillary, before I move on to kind of diving into the actual challenging behavior piece. Did you have anything you wanted to add? Yeah, you know, I do. I, <laughs> thanks for throwing me the softball there. I, um, I just can't, I don't know. I can't emphasize this enough. I think oftentimes it's like, well, we gave them all the things that they want and they have access to everything that they could want. And there's a person available. And especially when you're working with learners who maybe have a really long learning history with adults being not trusting or pushing them to do things or, um, not knowing what the dynamic of the relationship is, this this goes beyond SR, right? Like you could give a kid everything they could ever want, but and your full attention, but without that underlying piece of trust, true trust, not just a five minute interval of trust, but like I have shown you over and over, and I have repeated this with you so many times that you can actually trust what that what I'm saying is what I'm actually going to do. This can be a barrier for tr for any treatment, not just PFA and SBT, right? Like the therapeutic alliance is the basis of all therapy. And I think that we sometimes forget that in ABA, that we have to have that therapeutic alliance with our clients before we can move into treatment. And I think that um, 
there's a lot of research about that in psychology, and, um, but not as much in ABA. And I think we missed the mark a little bit. So I, in terms of the PFA application, I think sometimes it's important to remember that maybe five minutes or one session isn't enough time to build this therapeutic relationship with the learner and to be okay exposing ourselves to that HRE and SR condition multiple times to make sure that it's not just a pairing, it's actually a relationship. Awesome, thanks, Hillary. Does anyone else have any thoughts or questions before we move on to the next part? <laughs> yeah, Karen said, unfortunately, the insurance companies create contingencies sometimes that discourage that. Um, and that that's true. And I think, oops, we can get a, we, like, I think we can be creative about things. Um, hi. Especially if you're working with autism, the DSM, I'm not a huge fan of the DSM, but it's what we have to base our treatment planning off of. And I think because of our histories and how we're trained in graduate school to write treatment plans, we don't necessarily get um, how much we can use the DSM to really support these types of goals. If you look at the DSM and you're supposed to be basing your treatment planning off of the symptoms of autism, that guy that I little one that I just showed you who desperately needs you to build a trusting relationship with him. Um, he's, there's all those symptoms can be remediated, right? So you're not necessarily going to put your that like in your goal for your treatment plan is to just have a trusting relationship because the insurance companies might be like, what? But you can say you're going to see like X, Y, and Z operationally defined behaviors relating to engagement with um, the environment, the adults, like um, all of the things under like restricted and repetitive and all of that kind of stuff. So there are creative ways where we've done that, um, especially when we have learners who are like oblivious to us, or even if they're engaging in like a higher level of challenging behavior, we establish that like the primary goal that needs to happen first is to get engagement, <laughs> to get some active engagement going um, and we like, depending on the learner and what their unique needs are, we operationally define all of that and that's good enough. But a lot of people are too focused on the VB map or peak or the ABLES and they get sucked away by those assessments that include none of this stuff. So really it's not the insurance companies putting anything on us. <laughs> it's our rigid adherence to um, certain assessments that wouldn't necessarily account for this. Um, and obviously in combination with like our learning histories of what we think a treatment plan has to look like and all of that kind of stuff. Um, so that's my little rant on that, but yes. I remember att attending a training uh, you put on a long, it was a long time ago where you were basically talking about teaching behavior analysts to make goals outside of those assessments and using those assessments and curriculums as guides, but really making us like goals based on the learner and what you're seeing in front of you and what the environment is telling you is needed for goals. And I have always thought about that and I love that. And I think Penny's comment really speaks to that, that you can make goals around things that aren't in an assessment. It's like approach, um, happiness indicators is a really cool and interesting area for goal planning. Um, you know, any kind of joint attention can be measured in all kinds of ways, right? Like, so those, some of those do touch on some of those other curriculums. And I think you're absolutely right. Like look at your, look at the person in front of you and think about what they need and then build goals around that instead of taking a curriculum to the, the learner in front of you and giving them goals that maybe they don't even need right now. Yeah. And then and if you're looking, sorry, Kristen, I'll let you go in just a sec. Um, the, if you're looking at the, um, like, sorry, Karen, I don't know why I said Kristen. <laughs> it's late, totally it's Friday. Um, the, um, the assessment piece too, like approach and things like that. There are assessments that have those things like ESDM, um, the certs model. So there's, there are things, especially specific to autism that, that do measure that. We just haven't necessarily um, seen people in our field create things like that. Um, sorry, Karen, go ahead. No, I just was gonna add too that I think it's also important that we explain to the parents um, or and or teachers sometimes what it is that we're doing and why we're doing it. Cause I also find sometimes there's that pressure of, okay, well, let's let, you know, let's get started. Let's run right into this and let's, you know, let's work, work, work. And I think if we take that time to explain fully what we're doing, why we're doing it. Um, I think that also goes a long way in communicating so that people don't get a misperception of you're just playing. You're just having like, this isn't something that's therapeutic. Um, so that was just my two cents. 
Yes. And, and that's for me, if I'm in a situation, well, usually, and I have a whole webinar on like this topic on the do better collective on play and pairing. But if that's the case, like sometimes for whatever reason, people um, similar to like Penny suggesting some specific goals that you could have, they just don't like picture that you could write programs for play and pairing and stuff like that. And I have like tons of those. They're all based on shaping and I created them like 15 years ago. Like <laughs> it's something I've been doing for a really long time. Um, so I think that too is like, again, where we can get more creative and showing people that progressed, um, you know, like this is, we need to build up these skills here and then we'll be on our next phase of having these other skill acquisition targets in place and all of that kind of stuff. Um, Hillary, for some reason, your chat thing is set to everyone in waiting room. So like nobody can see your amazing shaping is life or That's too full bad. ABA field shift right there, or like any of the <laughs> comments that you've made. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll change that. What I was saying though, is, um, that the, what Karen's comment is, you know, if our field as a whole didn't set this expectation that ABA is so much trial, 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 work, 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 we wouldn't have to overcome it in the first place. Right. I think that's something we, uh, we need to do better as a field in doing, especially with little guys or, um, I mean, any kid, it does not matter where they fall in our service model delivery, the play-based teaching and the play-based relationship frame has to be at the core. And I think we're, we fail that the therapeutic, therapeutic Alliance, I think we fail it. And then yes, shaping is life. Those were my <laughs> comments. Thanks. All right. So we're going to do, we have a few activities that we're going to do. So this first one is called fluent connecting improv. So again, for those of you who have seen this presentation, you've done this before. Um, but basically what we're going to do is I'm going to say an item. And in the chat, I want you to type in as many different things as you can think of with that item. Um, I'm not sure. Hmm. We need to keep an eye on the one if you just admitted that person, because that was like a weird like name that came up, like not a real name. <laughs> um, so anyway, sorry. So when we do this, I want you to think about um, different things that come up for how to connect with people. So you know, some things that learners really like, like dramatic facial expressions, using things in a novel way, using things in a way that matches like how they engage with like stimulatory behavior, um, falling over, crashing, physical things like that. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say the name of the item. And then I just want you to type in like all of the different things you can come up with. And then I'll switch the name of the item and you'll switch to a different thing. You can picture it as, you know, a learner that's young, a middle schooler, an adult, whatever you work with and um, want to give. I try, the first one I'm going to use is a little bit for younger, but the other two are things that like even, you know, adults would be doing. So is everybody ready? You got your typing fingers ready to go? Okay. So the first thing is bubbles. Popping bubbles, mess, slimy goo on hands, play, pop it really loud, big facial expressions, laughing, soap, manding, bubble chase, dumping, pop, art with bubbles, chase, catching, spinning, imitating, blowing, singing, smell, jumping, waving, eat, anticipation, catching, dancing, twirling, use toy to pop. I think I saw beer, <laughs> stomping, giants. Um, bath challenge them to chase pop blow themselves catch a bubble without popping it eating them pretend to eat pretend toy eating bubbles awesome these are all great okay the next thing is drawing do it draw fast scribble the therapist draw yourself doodle chalk drawing on pavement draw pictures of each other draw on yourself finish a line therapeutic pictionary Rainbow of markers, hopscotch, choose colors. Don't say chalk to Hillary. <laughs> Add details to another drawing, face painting, take turns, stains on clothes, video model, happy colors, make a flip book, hand printing, mixing colors, draw pretend injuries, increasing leisure activities, 
Batik colors, draw pretend tattoos, sort by color using little lines or shapes, draw your family, rainbow colors, draw beer. Patrick's really into the beer thing tonight. <laughs> Love it. Use them to color napkins that you put in water. Okay, last one, iPad. How can you connect over an iPad? Take pictures, find songs to listen to, dance, frisbee, share an app, play games together, two iPads, caribou, throw it over a fence and watch it fly, <laughs> act out videos, watch with them enthusiastically, draw on the iPad, funny video, freeze dance, that cat voice game, Tom, I think, voiceover video, comment on the video, Snapchat filters, draw filters, video imitation, watch songs, drive over it with my car. <laughs> Patrick, you didn't incorporate beer this time. Come on, man. Um, use Zoom backgrounds as reinforcers, scavenger hunt for a beer, reenact videos. Um, okay, perfect. So we're going to stop there with this activity. You all did a really great job coming up with different ideas. This is something I like to do in talking about addressing challenging behavior for a few reasons. One, it just gets our juices flowing, right? When we think about fluent responding, if you're not consistently thinking about like, what are the million of different things I can do with these items that my learner likes, when you're in that moment with them, you're going to hit a wall, right? Like you're not gonna come up with what to do. It's also helpful as like a team building exercise with if you have other staff that you're working with, you can play games and kind of, you know, if you are in person, like physically do the things with them and, um, everyone's really different, has different ideas. So for me, I don't, I'm not that creative. So when I do this with like Claire, she does all these wild things and I'm like, what, <laughs> how did you think of all of these things to do? So then that gives me ideas the next time I have a session, but also just that practice and getting more fluent um, with the, the, when I go in my session, I'll be more likely to in the moment, be able to come up with different ways to connect with my learner. The other thing is I think sometimes we just, um, we miss like, and again, this is in the research. If you look at like developmental and play-based research, we miss some really easy things that we can do. And we think like, oh, you know, my learner loves the iPad, but there's no way for me to like connect with them over that. And there's so many creative things you can do. You all listed a ton in the chat. I did notice with drawing and with the iPad, there was a little bit less reference to the adult doing certain things with the, the child. So like with the bubbles, there was a lot of like dramatic facial expressions and chase and like different things that would be more interactive. So those, all of those things could be done with drawing or the iPad as well, right? Like you can make dramatic sound effects. You could fall off of your chair when they like score or something in a game. So there's a lot of different things that we can do even with um, materials that may seem sort of isolating and just one person can do it. You can still be like a cheerleader in the background or like a clown of some sort that just makes the experience better. Now, obviously some learners don't necessarily like that. So you have to be looking at how they're responding to you and basing what you do off of that. Um, yes, awesome. Karen says, we like to do an activity for new hires where we take a toy and have them first write all the things they can teach with it and then share. I love the idea of focusing on how to work on connecting with the kids. Yes, perfect. And this one is a combination of my own experience and then some exercises I've seen Steve Ward do when he presents as well. So. <laughs> Um, his is a little bit more intensive. All right, so we're gonna do a couple more activities. This next one is called connecting imagery. So for this one, it's gonna be a little bit different. What I want you to do, if you're comfortable with it, I'm gonna lay out the activity and then you're gonna close your eyes and try to picture this happening, okay? So for this activity, what I want you to try to picture is a current learner or a past learner. And I want you to think of a time when you are having like a really strong connected experience with them, likely doing something playful and fun that they were enjoying. And while you're letting that play out, I want you to notice a few things. I want you to notice physiologically how your body in this moment is feeling as you watch that visual play out. But I also want you to notice in the visual how the you and the learner are looking. So what are your facial expressions? Um, how are you engaging with one another? What is, what is happening for you as you watch this play out? So I really just want you to get in touch with this experience 
both how you're presently feeling and in the, the video, if you will, that you're watching for yourself, what that is feeling like for um, both people involved in the activity. Okay. So go ahead. I'm going to like talk a little bit, but then I'm just going to be silent for a few seconds so you can let the imagery play out. But if you're comfortable, go ahead and close your eyes. Try to picture yourself with, again, a current learner or a past learner. Picture whatever activity you all both enjoyed doing together. Really notice how you're feeling in this moment. Notice how your learner is feeling, what you see them doing physiologically, what it seems like they might be feeling. Notice how you in the imagery are feeling physiologically. What are your facial expressions? I'm just gonna be quiet for about 15 to 30 seconds and I want you to just keep letting that interaction play out. Okay, you can go ahead and open your eyes. If you're comfortable with it, um, type in the chat or if you want to unmute your microphone and just share what was um, happening for you in this imagery. So you can share how you felt physiologically right now as you were watching it, or you can also share um, what you saw happening and, and what interactions were going on. So Penny said, so happy, the smiles. <laughs> Excitement, smiles, joy, bouncing, fun, learning, relaxed, happy, all the feels, laughter, definitely happy, fun, learning, giggling, connected. Nothing else existed except our play scheme, calm and happy, quiet, and a happy quiet, <laughs> HRE, physical comfort and just focused on enjoying the game, paradise, chasing, yes, connected. Hugely dramatic overreactions to silly jokes, anticipatory with joint enjoyment. Perfect. Happy and engaged. How did you physiologically feel sitting there picturing that? If anyone wants to share, relax, warm and fuzzy, so awesome, all the feels, content, happy, <laughs> peaceful and happy, pure happiness, etc. Okay, wonderful. So I hope you all enjoyed that experience. We're gonna do one last activity. And thank you, I really appreciate how actively engaged everyone is with these activities. It really helps them go well. And I feel bad, Emily, I know it's so interesting because the first time I did this presentation was at our couch to camp last year online. And I was like, I don't know how this is gonna go. And that was when it was in early April. So it was like the shock of the everything that like, not, like we all just like saw our clients one day and then like didn't see them again and didn't know when we were gonna see them again. And it was very emotional for everyone um, then. And it's been emotional for each time I do this, but I think that was like one of the most emotional ones um, that I experienced in, in doing this presentation. Okay, so now what we're going to do is a little bit different. I have received some feedback from people that this particular activity is, is a bit triggering and aversive. So if you um, don't have the spoons right now to handle something like that or any other preferences around just not engaging in something that could potentially be aversive, I would um, ask that you mute your microphone and then when I'm done doing the activity, or not mute your microphone, but mute your computer. And when I'm done doing the activity, um, I will change the slide so that you know um, to unmute. So for this activity, we're going to go, we're gonna pretend like I am your supervisor and I am teaching you how to work with a client. And for anyone who's seen me present or knows anything about me, you'll know that this is not how I would really teach someone to work with a client. It's just for this, the purposes of this activity. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna flip into to supervisor mode and then I'm going to ask you to picture this playing out with you, okay? So, hello everyone, I am your supervisor. I am Megan and today I am going to teach you how to teach your clients to clap their hands. A lot of the times when learners are first 
working with someone, they may resist following the instruction to a demand. So when you ask your client to clap their hands, you're going to need to follow through on that demand. So this is what it's going to look like. I want you to sit down across from your client. I want you to say, do this, and then you're gonna clap your hands. Immediately reach for the client's hands and help them clap their hands. If the client resists you, you just need to, to pull harder, right? So like you can overpower them, you're bigger than them, you can do this. It's really important if they run away from you, if they kick you, if they hit you, you cannot let them win. They need to know that when they're told to do something, they must do it. So if they resist you and they're tantruming or doing anything else, you just need to follow them and say, do this, clap your hands like that, and then physically help them clap their hands. Even if they're pulling away from you, just physically help them clap their hands. When, um, when we do this, it's really important because if they don't learn in this moment to follow the instruction you're presenting, then they won't know how to follow any instruction. This is called escape extinction. And when we have learners who are trying to escape from demands, it's really important that they experience when a demand is placed, they must follow that instruction, okay? So now what I want you to do is we're going to close our eyes if you're comfortable with it. And we're going to pretend as if we're with our clients since we can't physically be with them. So when I tell you to, you're going to picture going into a room, sitting down across from a current client or a past client and running this trial with them and they resist you at great lengths. And I want you to follow exactly what I told you to do. Make sure you're physically guiding them through clapping their hands so that they don't escape the demands, okay? So go ahead and close your eyes if you're comfortable with it. Picture yourself walking into the room where your learner is. Sit down in front of them. Model clapping your hands and tell them to do this. You physically go to prompt the learner and they pull their hands back. So you present the instruction again. Model clapping your hands and say do this and physically guide them again and they're resisting you. And I'm going to stop talking for about 30 seconds, but I want you to picture that scene play out where you don't at any, for any reason whatsoever, give up on getting them to clap their hands. While the scene is playing out, I want you to do the same thing as we did before. Physiologically right here, right now, how are you feeling? And also notice in the imagery that you're viewing, how the person that you're watching is feeling um, and how the client is feeling. Okay, so everybody's already typing in the chat. So I'm just gonna go ahead and flip over to that. Um, I am gonna change the slide in case there was anyone that um, was muted. So for anyone who is muted, we're back. Um, and I, there are people typing in the chat how the, um, the imagery was for them. Lots of people saying they felt uncomfortable. This was icky. Some people couldn't even finish the activity. Tense, frowning, unhappy, so sad, upset, frustrated got bitten and smacked, um, heart rate rising in an uncomfortable way. And some of you might already be doing this, but if you haven't already, type in the chat, even just picturing it now or trying to, how did you feel physiologically right here in this moment? I see unconnected, sick, tense, disgusted. I'm clenching my teeth, like crying, cringe. Watching it felt cringy. I'm clenching my jaw. I was sweating, tense, anxious, exhausted, tense, gross. Realize I'm pairing myself with aversiveness, heartbroken, et cetera. Thank you again, everyone, for actively engaging in that activity. I know it's difficult. It's encouraging to see the comments that are coming in on the chat that like those of you who are watching this right now are hopefully not engaging in these types of interactions with learners. However, <laughs> This is what's happening day in and day out in clinics and in homes and in schools all around the world in the name of behavior analysis. This is what many of us were trained to do and many people are still trained to do. And even when 
people like us, I've been presenting on this since 2010, even when people like us are telling people there's a better way, they still choose to engage in this, this type of interaction. The reason I have this in the, this presentation, there, well, there's a lot of them, but I'll go over a couple. One is to help make that distinction, right? So like sometimes even in the moment, I don't know if it's human nature. I know that doesn't sound very behavioral, but even in the moment, as committed as we might be, I, this happens to me with my own son sometimes, we, we kind of flip into um, this mode, right? Like I will win, <laughs> you will do what I say, right? Even the most committed people who are looking to um, not use these types of interactions. Um, but I want you like, you know, having this contrast between how you felt when we were doing those early activities about being connected with the fluent connection and that imagery about connecting and like how amazing that felt for you and your pretend learner. And then that discrepancy of how this felt and, you know, looking at when you're physically engaging with a learner in that way, if it feels that way for you, think about how it would feel for the learner, right? So I want you to carry this forward with you and hopefully based on the comments, the people at least that are watching this live aren't doing these types of things. But even if you carry this forward with you now, when you're tempted to like, I, like you're on your agenda, you need to get the things done and you're just gonna make it happen. Hopefully this will come up for you and you will shift and relax and let it go, right? Because even with all of the, the amazing work that Hanley and his colleagues have been doing with PFA and SBT, I still, whether it's on the Facebook group or just people I engage with, people a lot of the time still hit a point where they're like, but we need to, um, we still need to force this thing to happen, right? There's, they don't have that patience to, um, to really work and see what's needed in the moment, so. Um, the other reason is to think about, again, that experience for the learner. So research shows that if people are under stressful conditions, they don't perform as well, right? So if we are trying to teach someone a new skill and then, sorry, can you all hear, still hear me? Okay. I got the connection. I'm stable. If you're trying to teach a new skill, you got a little, you got a little gargling, but you're good. Okay. If you're trying to teach a new skill and then you add in this like physical engagement, which is stressful for yourself. So if it's stressful for you and uncomfortable, the learner is obviously going to be feeling that much, if not more, right, of a, a situation there. And then at the same time, we're expecting them to learn something like, no, that's not going to happen. <laughs> if they're in that stressful of a condition, physically prompting through something is not necessarily going to um, result in any type of learning. Um, I can, can ask a question. Yeah. So um, what? Uh, so I I'm obviously all for HRE and finding it. I have found that in the past I've been the RBT. So I've been fortunate enough to now be the BCBA, and then I've already had that rapport. So then I find it easier. But now that I'm getting completely new clients that I've never seen before, and then it's okay, Penny. Let's find this HRE. It obviously takes time. And I noticed that um, sometimes it takes a lot of time. And what I'm finding most challenging is, and I'm a parent myself, so I feel very respectful saying this, that there comes a point where the parents like, okay, now we're done with this. Let's get some skills in. And I'm thinking, oh, I don't know. I don't think I'm there yet. Yet then we're, there's still the balance between um, matching the parents' desires too. And I do find that that's very challenging because I am fully aware um, if the parent does not like what I'm doing for long enough, I'm on the other side of the door. So that brings a lot of stress for me, not even the insurance companies. But the moment that the parent says, yeah, this is all great, but now let's get some skills in. And I'm thinking, yeah, I'm not done yet. So I'm very curious what your thoughts are. Yeah, so that goes back to what we were talking about earlier with the little one with the pairing and like developing a connection. A lot of it's how we frame things initially with the families that we're working with. It, it, they are learning skills. List out all of the skills they're learning and make sure they understand like these are the things that are being acquired here. 
this is the data we're taking on this. Again, a lot of people don't necessarily take data on that connection and like building a relationship. And you gave some great ideas of those things. Um, and then, uh, you know, having that clear pathway for the families when X, Y, and Z goals are met around this piece, then we move on to the next phase. Like I've never had a problem. I usually focus it around demand fading. So we'll have a very clear systematic program in place around demand fading. And they know from the beginning, like this is where we're going with this. And um, I might be too harsh here, but if they, if they fire me, they fire me. Like I'm not gonna shift how I engage with a learner just because they wanna see me as a drill sergeant. And we'll have that conversation, right? Like I'll say that I might not be the best fit for you then because this is not how I teach people. Um, and if that's the case, like it's, a, I, I, my heart breaks for that kid. That's going to go on to potentially a, a more difficult situation, but I'm not, I'm not there to, um, to, to be, I'm not there to be molded. Now I'm not also going to bring in my own like biases and like try to force the family to do a certain thing. I'll just be very open with them about these are my values. This is how I engage with humans <laughs> and, and that, you know, if you don't, if that, if you have different values and different preferences. There's nothing I'm, you know, I'm not judging you. And I'm also not going to, to shift based on that. Like that's just not going to happen. Um, now I've I kind of struggled with that a little bit, but like recently I've been listening to a lot of different experts in education and disability and just different areas. And it's very clear that like people have their niches, right? Like there's, you know, teachers teach a certain way, counselors counsel a certain way. Like there, are, there are people and, and even doctors, like when we pick our dentist or our eye doctor, our gynecologist, like we look for people that like match our, what we need or whatever, if we're not constrained by insurance or funding sources. So it, when that's the case with everything else, I don't know why now, obviously we need to be contextually and culturally looking at things as well. I'm not saying like to to do something in a way that would um, directly interfere with, with culture, but having that open conversation about like, this is how I practice. And my pra the way I practice may not be the best fit for everyone. And that's that, right? Just like you can, you know, people can switch their doctors or their whatever, because they might not like how they fit. Like there are so many parents that don't go to certain doctors because they're like forcing certain vaccine schedules and all of that different kind of stuff. Like we need to have that same kind of idea around behavior analysis as well. We don't have to compromise our values because a parent wants something a certain way. So that's my harsh answer. I don't know if that's helpful, <laughs> but that's what I say. Um, Emily said, I found that starting the relationship with this type of discussion and being really collaborative, it works so much better and avoid challenges down the road. Not that they won't come up, but it result in a ma much better match. Um, and Shubda said, try to understand the parent's learning history too. Have they experienced several agencies come in and out and not done much for their child? Not an uncommon experience, just a suggestion to try to take it into account with compassion regularly where the response is coming from. Yes. And that's what I'm like trying to convey. I just to get really passionate about this. So you can have these interactions in a compassionate and understanding way. But again, that doesn't mean you have to compromise and say, oh, you want me to be doing like your vision of skill acquisition are these things. <laughs> and even though like from my expertise and the way I value humans, we're not there yet, you shouldn't have to compromise and just flip into doing something that's likely going to be ineffective and not humane. Um, and, and so it's how you have that conversation with the family and especially what um, Shubha said about like, you know, why are they like, what's their urgency there? Why are they, why is this what they're picturing? And I'll have very honest conversations with families about that. Like, it, you know, I, I understand that these are the things you're valuing and this is the pressure that society might be placing on you about, you know, X, Y, and Z. Maybe we dig into that a little bit. It's not just me being like, well, I'm out. <laughs> you want me to teach your kids stuff? No, I'm gone, right? Like, it's not that type of conversation, but. Megan, can I kind of, this might be too much of a question to bite off right now, but what's your experience when one parent is kind of on board with the more humane side and maybe a military father, let's say, for example, is more of a like, let's, you know, I gave a direction, you need to follow the direction, you know, like, so what's your experience when you have parents who are also on different sides of this? 
Does that make sense? Yeah, it definitely makes sense. Um, I don't really have the best answer for this because I, I butt heads with Taylor's dad all the time. Um, but like, it's it'd be the same idea of having those conversations and really trying to help get them to understand like why we're doing things the way we're doing them. Um, Hillary, you had a really good answer for like kind of this question on the podcast. Yeah. I don't know if you want to chime in with. I was just thinking about that. I oftentimes like try to, I like to think about meeting people where they're at, right? So like meeting people where they're at in terms of what their goals are, what their values are, but also recognizing that people who are having these difficult conversations with us are, yeah. they, <laughs> my son just brought me a treat. It was very sweet of him. Um, <laughs> they deeply yeah. care. Yes, you can have one. They deeply care about the child too, right? Like they're not, they're not asking or having that conversation with you out of any mal malicious intent or um dislike of their child or you know they deeply care right so that's coming from a place of wanting <laughs> everyone says hi to you Elliot um <laughs> of deeply wanting to to do the best by their child and I think if we can frame it from there and meet them in that place we can come somewhere from there and it might not be where I want to be right like I don't know how many of you have listened to my podcast, but none of my families, I don't know about that, but I haven't like shown my clients the podcast um, because I just don't know. I don't want them to feel like that value is something I'm putting into my client relationship with them. Right. That's my personal value, but ideally I really want to get to that place where we're in agreement about these values, right? Like they don't have to do it the perfect way, but the value is the same. And what's important about the connection is the same. So for me, if I can meet, you know, I, I live in a military town. I've worked with a lot of military families. I know what you're talking about, right? If I can meet that parent, father or mother, or some other kind of parent, right? Whoever's caring, grandparent, grandmother, whoever, who is a disciplinarian, meet them there and say, yes, I hear this is what you want. And we can do some of these things, right? And while we're doing some of these things, I also want to be doing some of these things. And none of those things are in direct conflict of either of our values, what I have found, and sometimes it can take years, but what I have found is eventually we get to this place where we're on the same page, right? And my good dear friend, Beth is on here and she likes to talk about this as shaping adult behavior, right? So like yep. I think about as a BCBA, not only am I teaching my text to shape the client behavior, I think it's my job to shape the adult around that child's behavior to be closer to what we're trying to accomplish because sometimes the jump is really, really big. And I tell families, I'm not asking you to climb Mount Everest in a day. I'm just asking you to take the first step with me. And if we can do that together, I oftentimes get a lot of buy-in and be able to push together and they start to see some of those results, especially if we can cherry pick some things, right? Like if we can cherry, like with the PFA process, what I love is being able to show a family, being able to turn a behavior on and off. That's a cherry pick thing I can do and say, look what I can do. Let's have some rapport over this. This is a beautiful thing that we can do together. Um, and it can get more difficult from there. But I think, you know, ultimately if we come from the place of knowing that the family or the parents who are arguing with you are doing it because they deeply care about their child and they, or their adult child, whoever, that they really, 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 really want the best for them. If we can sit in that place together and grow from that place together, I think that's a really, a beautiful thing. And again, it can take a long time. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Thanks, Hillary. And Penny, hopefully both of those give you like a good mixture um, of an answer because mine was more ranty, but <laughs> um. Hillary, when you get a chance, can you post a link to the podcast in the chat? Because a few people are asking, and I think it's going to share my whole screen somehow if I try to grab it. Okay. Um, so I forgot to mention before we started that I didn't actually get to eat dinner before we started this. So I've been sitting here with like my bowl of food next to me. So you all are going to see me eat while we watch this video. Sorry. Um, but this is... a. Um, basically what I consider a little bit more of a supportive alternative to um, what we were imagining. Hi, Hi. I totally. <laughs> He's saying, hi. she's saying hi to Elliot. <laughs> 
Um, so this is for like the imagery that we did, it, what we were picturing with like force prompting and all of that, this is an alternative to that. Um, if we have time, I might talk about a different example. I'm not going to show the video, but I do want to show this one first. Oh, and just so you know, this is me with my son. <laughs> and the reason that um, you'll see in the video, I'm having him put his truck down nicely. He was in this like throwing phase. He was about 18 months old and or mm, maybe a little bit older than that, but he was throwing stuff. And it was not safe, you know, for daycare and things like that. So I'm trying to help him learn without me forcing it with him choosing to do it on his own, um, but also keeping him in a nice, you know, as relatively calm state as possible. Uh, and then we go into um, reinforcement, you know, once he follows the instruction. This is a video of me following through on a demand with my son to put his truck down nicely after he threw it. You can see in the video that I'm moving him away from his toys and following through with the demand to put the truck down nicely. I'm assessing the environment and figuring out what I need to do to get him to follow the instruction. I push his toys away so that he's more likely to follow the instruction. And anytime he reaches for something, I block access to it and repeat the demand. I want to support him in being successful in following this instruction. So I'm also assessing what I can do to support him in following the demand. You can see that he reaches for me and wants me to hug him. I can't do that because that would be too reinforcing, but I do need to balance keeping him calm instead of having a tantrum. So I let him sit on my lap. Notice that I'm not hugging him or positively engaging with him. I'm just letting him sit on my lap to help him stay calm and follow the demand. Anytime he shows an interest in something, I will repeat the demand. But if he's not showing an interest in something, I will wait until he has an interest in something. I'm also assessing what could push us closer to achieving the goal of putting the truck down nicely. And I'm looking at his behavior to see if there are things that I can promote and reinforce that will get us closer to our goal. You ready to put it down nicely? He does move closer to the goal by picking up the truck. So I let him do that because he's putting it away and that's closer to our goal of putting the yellow truck down nicely. Now I can capitalize on this momentum and have him put the yellow truck down nicely in his toy bin and give him all sorts of hugs and kisses and finally hold him as a reinforcer. Okay. So that um, that video, I like to give the disclaimer and I actually see a question come up. <laughs> exactly what I was just about to talk about around um, how much soothing and things like that are okay. So for me in that moment with him and just knowing what we were working on. So this is, it's one of those things where it's like demonstrating for you the thought process I'm having and like how to, how many different variables and things I'm thinking about. I'm not just like blindly following a 10 step intervention plan. I have like all of this stuff going through my head of like, what do I need to be doing right now? And I'm observing him to figure that out. It's not just like, Oh, these are the steps I've told him he needs to put his truck down nicely. And that like, so I'm going to go into this like five-step plan to do that. It's looking at what he's doing and then gauging my behavior off of what he's doing. So for him, for this specific thing, he, um, he was staying relatively, he wasn't escalating, right? Like he was saying no, and he wasn't doing what I asked him to, but he wasn't starting to like get a little bit more upset, right? He wasn't showing any more signs of stress or anything like that. If he had, that's when I would have comforted him more, which is the opposite of what we're typically trained to do, right? But that's where like, if he, if for whatever reason, I'm what, what I'm expecting of him is increasing his sort of like stress response there, then I need to help him figure out how to shift back into a more neutral state. I don't need to keep pushing on him and try to get him more and more stressed till he escalates into a tantrum for like an hour, right? Especially given his age and his developmental level and all of that kind of thing. Um, 
And also just, hi, we're all adults here. If someone did that to you, would you calm down? No. If you're already like coming into a space and you're already physiologically aroused and like upset about something. And then someone, instead of like giving you space and like um, letting you sort of reset, they were like, well, here you go. And like tried to force some activity down your throat. You would just probably like storm out of the room. You're not going to sit there and just do the thing. Right. Um, so I don't know why we do that to children <laughs> or adults. Um, but anyway, that's an aside. So that's how I like, it's just, it's really just like kind of a dance of, you know, observing him and figuring out what he, what he needs. What's he, what is he doing? That's pushing him closer to the goal. How can I support that? But also if he's trying to make choices that aren't really towards the goal and he's staying regulated, I can pull back a little bit to help again, shift him towards that goal that he needs to make. So if I hadn't pulled those toys back that he was trying to play with, he would have just played with the toys and never put the truck down nicely. Right. So there's this like balance you have to find of like what the goal is and the goal has to be important enough. Right. So like I've had situations where um, it's like, Oh, maybe just playing with the truck. Maybe I wanted him to play with the truck and he says, no, am I going to then restrict access to all of the other things until he plays with the truck when he's like 18 months old? I sure hope not. Right. Just because that was my idea to play with the truck doesn't mean he needs to do that. Right. Um, no, I should see, observe and see what he wants to play with instead. And then, you know, talk about that. Oh, you didn't, it looks like you didn't want to play with the truck. We can play blocks. Right. Um, as opposed to being like, I said, we're playing with the truck. Let's go. Right. Um, but that's a lot like what happens in when we're providing our interventions. So that's like a whole separate We like Hillary said, could be here for hours if I talk about this for too much longer. Um, but one of the things that, um, I want you to think about with that video too, is like, what is he learning in this specific situation? Right? Like he does say no a couple of times. And if it wasn't about putting the truck down nicely, Meaning if I wasn't trying to help him learn a safer way to have his toys and he said, no, I probably would have been like, okay, you don't want to do this right now. Let's go do something else. Like again, playing with the truck, but throwing toys that could hurt children is not okay. Right? Like that's a dangerous behavior. So even though you're saying, no, I'm not going to force you. I wasn't holding him there. He could have walked away at any point. I still would have brought him back and had him put the truck down nicely, but he's, he's, he's not um, being forced to, to do the thing, right? So um, he's learning how to, A, kind of keep himself, I hate to say this as a behavior analyst, but like he's keeping himself centered and regulated, right? Like he's, there's a, there's a version happening for him, but I'm keeping it like low enough and I'm supporting him enough that he can sit with it and navigate it and still be successful and make a choice and follow the instruction that was presented. But if I pushed in too hard on him, escalated that physiological response, then we're going to get to a point where he, he can't like that. It's just going to be a tantrum <laughs> and like, there's not going to be any opportunity to practice anything. Additionally, if I had just left completely and been like, Oh, you're upset right now. Let's just not do this at all. There's two things that are happening. One, he's not going to learn that replacement behavior of putting the truck down nicely. And then he might hit a kid at school or daycare Two, He's not learning how to navigate that difficult moment. Right. And we all have to learn how to navigate those difficult moments. So, um, this isn't, I don't know, Hillary, if you want to tie into this at all with like the PFA and SBT, this is obviously was not an example of PFA and SBT. Um, but I do think one of the things when we're looking at like shaping and supporting our learners that we have to think about is making sure we're not there. There's definitely time periods where we, we're giving them the world and everything has to be so easy and like so um, neutral and happy, relaxed and engaged. But it, but uh, there's going to come a moment when you've worked through that stuff and now you have to help your learner figure out what to do when things aren't going the way they want them to and how to sit with that and navigate that. Um, that's a, like a whole separate live that I think live zoom thing we could have. Um, but Hillary, did you want to add anything before I move on? 
Yeah, I have two things. One is a very scary thing for behavior analysts to say, which is in that moment, I would also say it's okay to like tact what's happening, right? Like, oh, you're really, you really are frustrated. You want to play with that. Like, I see that you're, you want those toys. I need you to put the top, the truck down. And I think um, that can really help support that emotional regulation piece of like recognizing the feelings that are happening, even if we can't, we don't know what they are, like putting names to them, putting um, reasons behind them and putting some choices or some possible solutions around them as well. Um, with the PFA process, I think what can be helpful to think about, and I, I agree, this is really hard to treat speech checks to do. So I oftentimes come at it from a, not necessarily a behavior analysis standpoint. I just try to like talk to them about what they would do with any kid, right? Um, which I think helps frame it a little better. Like this is just ways of dealing with people. <laughs> it just doesn't have anything to do with autistic people. It's just, how would you treat any other person? And I think with the PFA, we oftentimes have questions in the group about shape. Like you can only micro shape so much before something, some direction has to be followed at your first cab or your second cab or your third cab, whatever it is, wherever you're at. Um, so we can get to a point where maybe there's an easy entry point where it's maybe something very simple, but this will probably come into play when you're actually trying to get that um, compliance with a direction. I hate using that word, but at least engagement with a direction when you have really aversive, when it's really aversive to a client. And I think that's a beautiful way to, to show how you can push through to get acts like to get engagement with the direction and then reinforce really quickly. And sometimes that's what it's going to look like is you have to help that person get in contact with this, with the um, step that's going to cause reinforcement to occur. And until you can get there, you might have, there might be a little bit of strife and struggle and finding the appropriate shaping step to pick that, like Megan said, is an important, like it, it's worth it, right? You're not gonna cause a big escalation, but there might be a little bit of discomfort and you can kind of get there, get them in contact with it, then get, then get them in contact with some of the variability that comes in with this process. I think um, it happens. I know it happens because it's happened to me and I've seen it happen in the group multiple times where people ask these questions. Um, and that's a beautiful way to, to consider how to push, how to push, right? When we talk about push to the next step, in your cab chain, that is what I think it should look like, right? It shouldn't be a severe problem behavior. You might have a little bit of um, dif like discomfort, but but you get there rather quickly. It's not a long drawn out process. And then it's over and done with and everyone's okay afterwards, right? There's no no hard feelings afterwards. So those are the, those are the two things for me on that one. You're muted. Sorry, I didn't want you to all have to listen to me eating. Um, the I don't know if you could hear it in the video, but I, I talked to him a little bit like, oh, you want to do this? Like, let's put the truck down. But at that time, for me, like as a parent, skill wise, I didn't have what Hillary was talking about. Like I hadn't learned about that yet, whether it was through my own discovery or reading different parenting things. So I was a little bit more quiet than I would have liked. So I appreciate you pointing that out, Hillary. And I think there was someone in the chat too that says like, it's just so odd, like why? Mm -hmm. I'll tell you my my uh, thing, but not while we're recording. I'll wait till the end. <laughs> so if anybody reminds me, um, I will share, but I'm not, it's not something I'm ready to put on a recording yet. Um, like why we're just we are so afraid way. to talk about emotions. I mean, yeah, but we know internal events exist and we can take contextual clues from the environment and make an educated guess and help a, help a child learn what those contextual cues in the environment are to tell us what's going on with them, right? Like modeling is the most powerful form of learning. So if we can model this for our kids, even if they never say it, right? Even if they might not ever be able to say, I'm sad for whatever reason, maybe they never say it. It's still tacting what is happening around them and helping them understand contextually what is going on in the environment and physiologically within them. And what, what skill is more important to teach a child? Yeah. This is Megan and I had a ranty text message about this earlier today, preparing for this Zoom tonight. <laughs> this, is, this is where our rant ended. I just don't know if there's anything more important to teach um, children who don't understand the world that's going around, on around them, then how to manage their environments and how to manage themselves in those environments that are not comfortable. Yep. And it's interesting because in like a lot of different cultures, um, they do work on these things. 
<laughs> but that not in the States and definitely not in behavior analysis at the moment. Um, I don't know if any of you have read Steve Hayes third wave uh, article from 2004, but it's, it's fascinating to me um, that he talks about this in that article from 17 years ago. How was that 17 years ago? Um, and talks exactly about like how the first wave and the second wave didn't acknowledge these things, but the third wave, it, it is. 17 years ago, he said that, and there are still, I would say 90% of our field is not doing those things. Um, so I just find that fascinating. But anyway, that is not my, my thing. Uh, like I said, maybe when we're done, if we have time, I'll tell you what, where I think things come from. All right. Um, Karen asked if someone can share that article. Karen, if you send me an email, Megan at dobettercollective.us, I can send it to you. It's also, if you Google it, I think I got it without having to like down, it was like, he has it out there for free or whatever, but I can't remember. Um, okay, so function isn't the only thing that matters. That's a quote from me, <laughs> maybe some other people, but I think there is an issue in our field as well, where when behavior analysis was first developed, developing as a science, there wasn't necessarily a functional understanding of behavior and then Awada especially pushed things forward with the research that he was tasked to do on behavior in determining what the functions were. So the pendulum like swung the other way. And I was like, oh my goodness, we can figure out function. And like, we know why someone's doing something, but then people just like over-focused on that. So like, it's always function why something's happening. Like we completely forgot about respondent conditioning or skill deficits. Like, no, those things still exist. Those are still things we need to take into account. You can't just identify that something, um, you know, that they got out of a demand or they were given attention or they escaped to go play on the iPad or whatever it is. Like, just because that thing happened does not mean that is the answer as to why the challenging behavior is occurring. It's an observation. It's possible that's why. But if there are skill deficits present, if there's respondent behavior happening, if there's a chain um, that's been established, it won't matter that you've identified what happened after the challenging behavior occurred. Um, Jenna Lee, did you really raise your hand or was that by accident? I saw you like pop up for a second with a hand raise and then disappear. So I think it might've been by accident, but. Yeah, it was an accident. Okay. <laughs> All right. So um, we're gonna look at what I mean by this with breaking the chain in practice. So this is a, a little guy who he was, um, he, his like go-to thing is to, to bang his head on stuff when he's upset. And we had made some really great progress on helping him learn um, to like not be so reactive to things and engage in, in calm behavior. But he still wanted to be mad sometimes, right? Like we all get mad. Um, so we were trying to teach him how to be mad. Um, and his go-to for being mad at the time was to bang his head still. Right. So we had these like situations coming up where he was legitimately mad about something. And the only thing in his repertoire to do when he got mad was to bang his head. It would not matter what the function is of that behavior, right? Like it's not going to matter if mom never gives him the thing. If mom never lets him escape the demand, if he does not have the skill of what to do when he's mad, he's still going to bang his head. And especially when it's an established chain that has more of a respondent function to it of like neutral stimuli being conditioned like aversives and then he bangs his head. So that piece is a little bit harder to tease apart, but the key here is function did not matter in this situation. We needed to make sure that we were spending time helping him learn how to demonstrate mad in different ways and then giving him opportunities to practice that. So this is a, there's two videos here. The first one is gonna show mom just practicing, transitioning between calm and mad because even that is a thing that a lot of, um, even adults need to learn, like how to, when you're feeling a certain way, take yourself from that way to like a different way. Um, so that's the first video. And then the second video is going to show her practicing what to do when mad and then presenting a trial. I'm going to keep eating. 
while we watch the videos. Oh, yeah. So, I want you to sit right here. Okay, hey, watch. Let's do calm. Show me calm. Huh? Don't touch. Just wait first. Breathe. One more time. Okay, that's calm. What can we do when we are I love to watch, calm. do this? Oh, we do that when we're mad. Yeah. Watch, do this. Oh, we can do that when we're mad too. Okay, what about this? We can do this when we're mad. Okay, when I'm mad, I can. What else can you do when you're mad? When I'm mad, I can. Yes! <laughs> when I'm mad, I can. <laughs> goes on a little bit with the practice so you see the practice of being calm and mad and then this is this video shows practicing it right beforehand and then doing the trial when you're feeling so mad what else can you do what about with your hands so what else can you do when you're so mad? And then, uh, yeah, and stomp. You can do those things when you're so mad. Oh no. Okay, give octopus. Yeah, give octopus. So if you're so mad, you can do this. Oh, do you feel better? Better. <laughs> Here's octopus. <laughs> okay, Hillary, I love shaping down the less dangerous topographical forms. It is okay to be mad. We need to be safe when we are feeling big emotions. Perfect. Yes. And we had like other interventions in place to work on the safe safety aspect. Um but so when I watch this video, I kind of already explained the reason why we were working on these things. I'm curious, Hillary or anyone else, what comes up for you, like how to, you know, connect this with like the PFA and SBT process. I almost went to the chat and I was like, oh, I can unmute and talk. Um, I have, we are about to announce a new hangout in April about unreasonable man and man compliance, right? So we could all day long say that an SR condition can keep things safe, um, which is totally true until we come into contact with unknown EOs that we don't yet have a handle on or unreasonable situations that we don't yet have intervention for where we're still seeing those really big, big versions of problem behavior and we cannot deliver SR around, right? So like, while we might not do this in our like synthesized reinforcement package version of SBT, if you're doing a full SBT program, this is still gonna be really applicable when we're thinking about putting unreasonable mans on extinction because we're gonna have, they, uh, they naturally are gonna be put on extinction because we cannot give access. So for, I mean, I don't know how many of you have read my unreasonable mans thread in the group with Emily Kearney. It'll always go down in history as my favorite thread ever. But like one of my clients was wanting a game that literally no longer exists. There is no way that I can give access to that. Um, so it's going to be put on extinction, whether I not I want it to be or not. Oh, yeah. And big emotions are going to come out of that. And so this is a beautiful way to think about when we cannot turn off behaviors because we don't have SR to deliver, what should we be doing and what should we be teaching for those other moments that are going to come up? in treatment if you're doing full SVT. This might be a cap branch, for example, of teaching some of these skills. Um, for me personally, I feel like they just come up as they come up and we just, 
don't let your tool, your toolbox still matters, right? Like in SBT, your toolbox still matters. We still have lots of tools to use in these situations and we shouldn't let them go. So I think that's a really um, important place to think about how to place some of these skills and help learners engage in alternative behaviors that are not access to a synthesized reinforcement package because we just can't deliver it. Awesome, thanks Hillary. Um, there's a comment in the chat that chats that says it is completely unrealistic to expect our clients to never be mad. I often hear adults tell children, don't be mad. We need to make sure we're um, validating their feelings. That's not, the comment was different, but that's the point. Um, one of the things that comes up for me, and this is this might be my own learning history and I might be biased, but um, I think that so, one of the concerns I have with any process, whether it's people watching my trainings or like anything else is what Hillary was talking about with like your toolbox. So if you had a child like this, who immediately upon an EO being present was going into a headbang and you weren't taking time out of your PFA SBT process to do this type of practice, you're not going to be successful. You can't just shape this in a PFA SBT situation. Like it's not going to happen. You need way more practice trials around this. You need coaching and you need to help set them up for success so that when the skills-based treatment is happening, when they're in the situation that starts to make them hot, they've had an opportunity to demonstrate these skills. Um, there are certain things like a simple, yes, okay, can I have my way? Like all of that kind of stuff is not probably going to be very difficult to shape in your skills-based treatment. But if you're having learners that are engaging in this high level of like stress response, that's dangerous, as reinforcing as you might be and as happy or relaxed and engaged as you might be having your learners, it's, it's in, in my experience, not going to be very likely. Again, this is not based on research, it's just my own like practitioner brain here. Um, but that is one of the worries that I have that um, again, as good as we might shape things and. This is something Hillary and I were talking about earlier in over text message, even if you are successful. So let's say somehow you can shape this and you get a response where like the learners going through the motions and like doing the thing and engaging in the cab branch. That doesn't mean you were successful. What it likely means is they've learned how to push shit down. And they have not yet learned how to do the things that need to be done around encountering an aversive situation you've either helped make the thing less aversive for them and they have a new, they are tolerating stuff, which is great. Or they've learned how to topographically observably on the outside, show you they're happy, relaxed and engaged, but inside, you don't know what the heck's going on in there. What are they battling inside themselves? And as they get bigger and older and don't have the opportunities to practice these skills and be coached through this stuff, you're going to have some problems. Now that's not saying you couldn't put it into like a skills-based treatment paradigm where you're in that, in the skills-based treatment coaching and doing similar things to what I'm showing you here. But if there's just this like assumption that a learner who's getting treatment for a reason is just magically going to start showing these kinds of like coping skills and like navigating stuff just because we're using a shaping process. If your shaping process is not teaching those skills, it's not going to happen. It has to be part of the process. Um, and I, okay. I, we had yeah. a we had a pre meeting planning session yesterday for our hangout about unavailables. And what I said there, and I'll say over and over again, is um, oftentimes I find the students of mine who really struggle with unavailables kind of fit this profile more, and we don't get to move on in treatment until we figure out the unavailable piece. Like we are, we are, we could make maybe some pro progress and we can get a CFCR and a TR, but truly until we figure out some of the pieces that are fitting into that hotness of unavailables and the, like, and oftentimes I've learned who are seeking those things, right? Like they're, they're actually, and I see this posted in the group all the time. It's like, well, they're purposefully asking for that unavailable thing. And to me, that's a skill deficit, right? Like they're, they're literally incapable in that moment of contacting that hot EO and managing it. And no skill-based treatment is going to do that for them because we can't actually give them access to that unavailable man. And so oftentimes I have clients who keep looking for it and looking for it and coming in contact with that, which prevents us from getting HRE anyway. So we can't even move forward with treatment until we figure this out. Yep. 
And Alicia, we kind of mentioned this already, but Alicia said you can modify the FCR and TR to include these skills. And that's exactly why we have this in here, because I think I, and I'm just basing this off my own exemplars of trainings that I've seen and posts that I've seen, these things are not coming up as things that people are working on in their skills-based treatment. And I'm nervous about that. <laughs> so I want to make sure like, it's great that there are people doing it, but if the multiple exemplars of what people see being talked about and demonstrated don't include things like this, then there's going to be moments where people are trying to push a, a learner through who has this type of profile and it's not going to be successful in the way that we're talking about. I also do want to make one mention of something um, just kind of came up for me. There's adults who are in ACT, right? Like they're, they're going through acceptance and commitment therapy sessions to learn as adults how to work through their different emotions and like let things go and do the different things. And there's a lot of talking and a lot of coaching and a lot of working it out with their therapist, like how to manage all of that. Um, and yet somehow we don't recognize the value of that type, same type of coaching and teaching in our sessions. There's a lot of like, let me wait and see if it happens, see if we can get it through some type of creative extinction burst or anything like that. And it's like, if adults who should have more skills than children are needing a high level of like language and interaction with someone about this stuff, why would children not need something similar, right? So again, just kind of asking you to think about like how quiet people tend to be when we're trying to teach skills with our learners and how much more like labeling and things like that probably need to be happening. All right. So look at this it was supposed to be like a 30. I mean, we are pausing to have discussions, but <laughs> I don't even know where we are right now. Okay. So finally to the main point. The three steps to compassion. So when I'm looking at addressing challenging behavior, these are the three big things that I think are important. One, we need to make sure we're being comprehensive. Two, we need to make sure we're including the big four. And three, we need to make sure we have shaping. Before we do dive in on that, there's a question in the chat. So it says, what if a child has no skills at all and he is banging his head for all the functions, like for tangible, for attention, for escape, how do you teach the replacement behavior? Um, that's kind of like where this guy was when we started and we basically just had to work around every single context with him and do a lot of practice with like, this thing is happening and this is what you can do instead. So in neutral moments, we would practice whatever the thing was instead, whether it was just sitting there and doing nothing, <laughs> whether it was saying, okay, whatever it was, um, we would practice that response during neutral times and just through mom had really, has really great. Um, instru an instructional relationship with him. So she could just even like do imitation training with him around demonstrating some of those replacement skills and then slowly present similar to the SBT process, um, whatever the context is that was difficult for him. So for him, it was giving up items, waiting for items, being told no. So she would present a trial with that. I go, I, I think our demand fading webinar on the Do Better Collective shows videos of that. And then the Navigating Challenging Behavior webinar has examples as well. So you can kind of see him go through that process. And I'm gonna jump in with the SBT. In the SBT model, you would just make this a cab branch, right? So if you maybe even, a, even there isn't a neutral moment to do this, you might do your SBT process and create a cab branch where this is where you, you go to, this is what you're teaching in your branch. So your branches, when this situation, however it is for your learner, you're practicing these alternative behaviors, you're practicing the scenarios that they come in, come up in, you maybe are practicing contacting some of these things in your branch, and maybe not outside of that, if it's too triggering in the, or if it's too hot, for example, in your SBT process. So I'm just going to go through what these three steps are. This is an overview. Like I said, I'm planning a longer training on this. Um, but the first is to be comprehensive. So that means you're looking at skill deficits. You're also considering the probability of effective implementation of whatever plan you've come up with. Far too often we come up with plans that like don't work for the environment that we're creating them for. Changing motivation and reinforcers, the, um, especially the PFA really helps with that and like that you're synthesizing and really just learning what turns things off and on. 
And then the fluency of the replacement behaviors. For me, that's going back to what I showed before. Again, in your skills-based treatment, if the replacement you're looking for is not that effortless for the learner, is not that easy, then you're probably going to need to be having extra practice time outside of your skills-based treatment where you're simply practicing engaging in neutral times um, in those replacement behaviors, whether it's taking a breath, saying, okay, asking for my way, um, you might need to be building up fluency with those replacements. Um, there's another question. How are we able to tell if these calming strategies are actually making an internal difference? Like you said, some clients are just pushing it down or faking HRE. Phyllis, that is like the million dollar question. <laughs> but Hillary and I were talking about that as well. Um, it, you know, unfortunately, if the learner is not, you know, telling you what they're thinking, right, if there's inner behavior happening, but they don't, whether it's vocal communication or whatever communication they're using, they don't express it, or even if they have the vocal communication skill set, but they still won't <laughs> express it, then um, it's, it's going to be pretty difficult. So from my end of things, I at least want to be doing all of the things I possibly can to make it more likely that they're engaging from a space where they're truly being supported and learning how to navigate stuff, as opposed to just trying to push them through things and not accounting for the fact that these are skills people need to learn. We all need to learn these skills. Again, even as adults, there's a lot of us um, who don't have these skills because we were never taught them. <laughs> um, so that's, that's me. Like, I just, I'm going to be comprehensive about it. I'm going to do the best I can to make sure I'm modeling and coaching and demonstrating, Hey, when rough stuff is happening, this is how I can navigate that. And this is how I can sit with it. And this is how I can let it go. Um, a lot of the, the stuff, you know, from act and whatnot, but like address, adjusting it for the age and like skill level of the learner you're working with. Because at least if I'm doing that, it's more likely that those types of things are being acquired than if I completely scrap it, period, and don't, don't do anything with it and just try to push through. Um, hopefully someday we'll be able to. I know, you know, there's the, the app, or not app, but the product called Mightier that's based on um, looking at neurofeedback, right? So they play game. It's like a game, and there's... Um, things that go, I don't have it, but I think maybe it goes on your finger, go somewhere on your body and they're able to measure like heart rate and all of those like physiological responses. So the biofeedback and like neuroscience work that's being done to see what's going on physiologically, um, the more we can get that synthesized and pulled in with behavior analysis, I think we'll have a better way. It won't, it still won't give us an insight into their thoughts, but we'll at least be able to see like physiologically is this something like, is this going smoother for them? Um, is there a difference in how that looks when you work on helping to coach through stuff versus just trying to push through and all of those types of things? I, there's a lot of research questions that still need to be answered around that particular area. Yeah. And I also want to add, I think um, making it okay to have those feelings. I mean, I think at the root of all of this, like I'm going to keep saying it. I think our field just does a really bad job of this, of making it okay to feel big emotions, making it okay to take that moment, making it okay to sit in discomfort, making it okay to ask to walk, to like to walk away or to engage in whatever coping looks like for an individual because it's individualized, right? I think if we can make space for those things and allow them to be present without trying to do anything about them in the first place as our number one goal, then we might be able to get a better handle on these things um, because we're not trying to push through them and we're recognizing them and we're labeling them and then we're teaching skills around them. But I don't even think that we allow, and we, I'm not talking about necessarily people here, but collectively, I don't know that as a field, we allow for these things to occur um, in our practice. Like oftentimes it's, you know, don't be mad, don't be sad, do this thing anyway. You should you know, I told you, I said so, so this is what should happen. I mean, even, I even find myself falling into that trap with SBT when I am trying to push to, to the next step of taking a step back and saying, is this really the step I want to push on, right? Like, is it okay right now for this, this person to have these big emotions and these big feelings and I need to make space for them, tact around them and help them problem solve? Maybe, maybe not, 
but help them in that moment, however is best for them to manage the, that discomfort and move through it and move on from it, or maybe not move on from it, right? I don't know for me personally, and I don't know if other people have experienced this, but there might be sessions at a time where we're not able to do anything because we're just making space for those big emotions and trying to work through them and trying to find a way to navigate them um, to get back to HRE. Yep. There's a few comments in the chat. First, thanks Celia for sharing the mightier link. <laughs> Um, and Alicia said, I've had to get really good at seeing really subtle signs. And I learned from past sessions, I've had learners that would choose to play with materials because they thought they should. And then you end up getting problem behavior in EOs. If I suspect this, I make sure to say often you can change your mind. We don't have to, whatever you want, it's your way, et cetera. Um, yeah. And that would be, I think is a, an issue that can come up quite a bit when you have learners who have learning histories of forced compliance and, um, escape extinction. And so like it, they're coming into the environment with like, this is how the thing works. Right. And like, even if they don't want to do it, um, they'll do it. <laughs> um, Emily said there was a great behavioral observations podcast episode with a researcher working on desensitization for necessary medical procedures like blood draws. And they use this amazing device so that they could sense even slight sweat increases on the skin and really tell when the learner was fully calm. Yep. Um, yeah, Celia, so yeah, our society is still not accepting suffering as part of the human experience. I do think that that is one plus of COVID though, in that more people have, because they're experiencing it themselves, have become more flexible and open to accepting it because they want to be accepted for their suffering. And it's unfortunate that it took the collective of people suffering <laughs> to let that be a thing, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're all engaging in perspective taking and recognizing that like other people's suffering is, should be held the same way that their suffering is held. But it's still, I think, pushing forward a little bit on that. So that's good. All right. So that's be comprehensive. Like I said, this is just, usually I go into like, I have slides on each of these things, but we just don't have time for that tonight. Um, prioritizing the big four. So the, this is from an article from Ala Rosales at all in 2018 from behavior analysis and practice. These are the big four preventative measures that they found um, when you are addressing these four things, you're less likely to have challenging behavior occurring. So one is communication. Two is gaining attention and affection, which would be how, how does the learner, you know, make those attempts to get attention and affection? Like, do they have skills around that or are they engaging in various um, challenging behaviors to do so? Engagement in activities would be things, it doesn't really matter, like it could be various self-stimulatory things, but it's really looking at in free operant situation, if not directed what to do, do they engage in activities or are they a learner? Probably because they had ABA that only focused on telling them what to do all the time that like literally needs to be told what to do all the time or they get themselves in trouble. Right. Um, and then the last one is tolerating coping with and accommodating adversity. And to me, this is the most important one. And this is what I was talking about with like the breaking the chain. If you have learners who, when various adversive things happen to them, they don't know not just how to tolerate, but how to also cope with and accommodate. We could, part of accommodating would also be like self-advocate around that, you're going to have difficulties, right? So it's not, again, it's not just tolerating. We need to make sure we're accounting for all of these things um, and helping learners. And what, they're, what, is, what they encounter as adversity is going to be different, right? Every learner is going to have a different experience there. So we need to be flexible and open to understanding what those things could be and then um, addressing it accordingly, but really helping to build up the skills around that. So when we're developing our intervention plans, whether using skills-based treatment or other types of interventions, making sure that you have programming in place to address all four of these areas. Otherwise, it's going to be difficult to um, compassionately address challenging behavior. And then the last one is shaping, which is where I thought we would spend a lot of our time tonight, but it's already 944, so it's cool. We have a fun video we're gonna watch. We're still gonna talk about it. We'll see how long we stay on. Um, but with shaping, I think a lot of the times, like everyone who's on here, it's probably not an issue, but at least for, um, most people in our field, when they think of shaping, they think of skill acquisition and usually just around vocal communication or maybe signs, but they, they think of like 
you know, being told, oh, it's when you teach cookie and they say cut and then uh, cook and then cookie and then cookie, right? And like, it's these different approximations towards like a vocal word, but shaping can be used to teach anything, right? And I, I'm kind of preaching to the choir on this particular presentation, but I do think it's important that we recognize within shaping how it's responsive to the learner. So um, a lot of the times I think, in our processes when we're looking at developing the cab branches there's like ideas people have based on their own learning histories or the assessments they're using or the goals the family has of like what those things what those cabs are going to look like and like what that should entail and they're not necessarily tuning into like what exactly is going on for the learner and like what are all the different variables that need to be considered there so when we're looking at shaping, whether you're using skills-based treatment or just shaping for any other purpose, you have to obviously assess first where the learner is currently performing. Then in your assessment, looking at um, how they're responding to stimuli in the environment and what stress responses are occurring. The PFA skills-based treatment process has like done leaps and bounds for the field on that like really like tuning in and observing your client and like, what is it that they're showing you? Are they happy, relaxed and engaged? If they're not, you gotta make some adjustments, right? Um, and then create small obtainable goals for navigating the challenging situations instead of black and white, all or nothing plans. Again, the skills-based treatment, especially with having, you know, going from the FCR through the different cab branches um, has really helped create a, a better streamlined process for people. However, in addition to that, when you're in, like I um, have seen temptations where it's like you're in a certain space on your cab branch. And so you've worked your way through and you've shaped to a certain point. And then something might come up for the learner that's more stressful that day for whatever reason or different. And there's still this rigid adherence to like, well, we're on this branch though. So we need to do this thing. And like, you start to see more extinction coming up and there's more of an adherence to the protocol and less of an adherence to seeing what your learner is telling you. What are they communicating to you and how do you step back and shift? Which is exactly what Hillary just put in the chat. So we're gonna watch a video. Um, if Again, if you've seen me present on this before, you've seen this video, but this is, I wish every single behavior analyst could shape like this lady. Um, she is a, just a regular person. She's never done training in behavior analysis. She did some dog training, but that's about it. Like she's. She has no degrees in behavior science. And this is her video showing how she re is replacing a poison cue with her dog. And I know it may seem weird that I'm showing a video of a dog to explain shaping, but I just there, I literally have not found a better video than this. So while you're watching this video, I want you to think about what are the things that she's doing and how does that align with um, when you develop your own behavior intervention plans, like do you go to this level of detail and of observation with your clients? Replacing a poisoned cue. This video shows the result of replacing a cue that was associated with stress and shows some of the training involved. Watch Summer's body language when I say stay and turn away. Head drop, eyes squinting. Look away. Stay. Lip lick, whale eye. Paw lift. Hey. Head drop, looking down. Whale eye. Now watch her body language during her new stay behavior with a new cue. Soft eyes throughout. Slow blink and deep breath coming up. Here's where the stress came from. 
This is Summer's old stay cue, as I was instructed to do it at a traditional obedience dog club in 2006. Stay. Here's how that looks from the dog's point of view. Stay. Even though I softened the verbal cue and hand signal over the years, they remained stressful for her. In 2012, six years later, I finally replaced the cue. Here's how. There were three things I needed to do something about. The hand signal, I dropped it entirely. The verbal cue. Stay. And summer stress during the moment I turn away. So first, I conditioned the new verbal cue by pairing it with food. With me in different positions, but always stationary. All she had to do was sit there. We did several hundred repetitions. Then I conditioned turns away without the cue. It's okay. I took several days to work up to taking a full step. If I went too fast and got a reaction, I backed up to smaller movements. Only after many reps of both the cue and the movements did I put them together and start training stay with duration, distance, and distractions. She seems so much more comfortable now. Thanks for watching. All right, so I have a slide after this that talks about like my observations when I watch the video, but I'm curious to hear everyone's thoughts first, like what comes up for you? Alicia said, so many of our learners need attention on shaping our EO Just recognizing that something. Oh, sorry. Oh, you're fine. Okay. I was just reading her comment real quick and then you can chime in. Um, so <laughs> yeah. the EO presentation, the ones that escalate with the stand and the clap, for example. Um, and then Penny said, we really take more time shaping. The attention to detail is impressive. Okay. Go ahead, Hillary. I was just saying, I think even just noticing that a cue is poisoned is like such an important step that we oftentimes really, really miss. Yep. Yeah. Cassie said several hundred trials. We sometimes are just not very patient, right? I love how she broke down so many steps and didn't try to rush. How long it took away to fade, how long it took to fade away the aversive stimuli. She pivoted her, um, her step based on the dog's response. So yeah. it's always a stimulus response unit and the stimulus that evoked her response came from the dog. Right. Exactly. It wasn't a treatment plan. No. It was looking at what the dog is doing and responding accordingly. I mean, there's obviously a plan in her head probably, but like it wasn't based on, oh, I have to follow these steps. It was the dog. She had many paths. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Recognize the stress cues like pre precursor level. Yay, Penny, you said it. I was hoping somebody would say it. How she took her dog's perspective. Y'all, we have dog trainers taking their perspective of their animals. And we're not doing that with our learners. I didn't do it right. Like for years, even with focusing on alternatives to escape extinction, I wasn't approaching my intervention development off of like, what is this experience like for them and how are they seeing the world and like, what's going on for them. It was just on what I was observing happening and like looking at the environment around them and like their skill sets and everything, but what's their perspective? Like what that whole, the, the hand in the face for the dog, like that is a huge issue, right? That like, if you're not trying to take perspective, you wouldn't notice that. Um, Celia said, I love how she got rid of those CMORs and use neutral stimuli. Yep. So that um, changing the cue, the vocal cue, 
the physical cue, <laughs> the tone, like all, so many things had to change. Um, Francesca said her tone was much softer, um, precise decisions. Yes. So this is, um, for me, these are, it's basically similar to what you all are saying, but um, first identifying what stimuli were involved. So that was like taking the perspective of the dog and like, why is this happening for them? Um, really looking again at what all of the stimuli are. It's, it's not just what's being said, it's what was said, how it was said, the positioning of it being said, the hand cue, like there's all these things. How many of us, when we're designing our intervention plans, whether it's PFA, SBT or any other intervention plan, are being that comprehensive and looking at what are all of the things happening for this person when the challenging behavior is occurring. Usually we see big things probably, but we don't necessarily take into account all of the various little things that could be going on. Now, again, with the SBT process and looking at the different establishing operations that could be present, that's made huge leaps for our field. But even in that, like, I know for me personally, I've still encountered situations where I was like, oh, I missed, <laughs> missed that one. Didn't know that that was a thing. Right. And it's over like a lot of careful reflection and consideration that, um, that that comes up carefully analyzing how to break the new instruction response down to the smallest level. This is also really important. The, um, the SBT process does do this and could do it more right? Depending on how you set things up, if, how, how big you make your FCR, how you're building your cab branches. You, you saw her smallest level. Her smallest level was not, um, you know, stand up, clap and present an instruction. It was sitting in front of the dog with treats saying one word. <laughs> that was her initial step, right? Now, I'm not saying that's what we're necessarily going to do with our clients, but it was really, really broken down. Um, so re really considering like, again, we're a lot of times we're so big picture and like, we're like, we really need to get to this point of being able to sit and do like hours of instruction that we make what our expectations are of like what the smallest level is like way beyond where the learner actually is for that. And it might even be several small levels that you're working on. So like she did the sit with the treats, but then she also reconditioned, um, the standing with no vocal at all. So there were different um, qualities of the, the, the final response that she was looking for. She shaped each of those separately. Hundreds of teaching trials. Cassie already touched on that. Like we need to be way more patient, right? Like if some, it's great if you can get through stuff super fast, but you may have hundreds of teaching trials and you know how you're going to know by watching the learner. <laughs> It's not a predetermined formula where it's like, oh, it's this thing. It's by watching the learner and moving back when necessary. Um, and that being even when, like, I love in the video how she's at a certain point and then she turns too quickly and she says how she would shift back. Again, we have to make sure we're doing that with our learners. Even though we may have made it to a certain point on any given day, there could be something going on for them that they're showing that stress response sooner and we need to move back. We need to be flexible in doing that. And then the last piece is that she's like super responsive, right? She's so cued in on like, what are the learner stress responses, the dog stress responses. Um, I'm super excited. I think in April, Julie, uh, Julie Press is going to be doing a presentation for us on this uh, research that exists around nonverbal stress responses, what those look like and how to be better at identifying those. So I'm like really super excited, both in people and in, she's going to show some like animal research too. So um, I met with her the other day and I can't wait to see that presentation. Um, let's see. Sorry. I saw a few things come through on the chats. Um, Celia said, I find a general improvement with practitioners to increase their observing and shaping skills and not implementing commercially available curricula and using ineffective stimuli, hoping they serve as prompts. Yes. <laughs> um, because of PFA SBT, but yes, we can all do better. Um, even before that, she changed the cue. She knew she wasn't going to be successful with that poison cue ever, right? And that's like, with a, especially with a lot of our learners, um, going back to like the forced compliance and escape extinction, we become, can become poison cues. And I have in the alternatives to traditional escape extinction webinar um, in the Do Better Collective, I go into more detail on that and talk about Jesus Rosales Ruiz's research on that. But um, the the issue then becomes if you're the poison cue, 
because for whatever reason, you didn't know about this and you found new ways of doing things or someone else is the poison cue. If you're trying to jump yourself right into PFA, SBT or any other intervention without reconditioning that cue, probably not going to be as successful, right? Um, and of course, it could be anything. I think some of you have probably heard me tell the story. Like I had a client once where um, I didn't know when told me and I had, hadn't seen her for a year and I came back from grad school and she, there was a big um, situation around writing her name on a piece of paper and she finally wrote it and I said, good job. No one told me I wasn't allowed to say good job. She stripped down and peed everywhere. That good job was a poison cue for her, but nobody told me that that was a thing for her. And then I felt horrible that I had like caused that for her, right? So um, a lot of things, like even things that we think shouldn't have that sort of effect on someone, if they've been conditioned in a certain way can be poison cues that need to be pulled. That doesn't mean they couldn't ever be put back into the environment, but we have to make sure we're attending to those things. Okay, so as you all know, there's a lot of different things we can shape. Um, one of, I mean, for me, I think in the SBT process, what I've seen come up a lot in the research and the posts on the Facebook group is, um, is, is these two, the response requirements and the presence of establishing operations for challenging behavior. I haven't seen as much the supports in the environment piece. And I think there's pluses and minuses to it, right? There's like a risk that, oh, there'll be reliance on it. But hi, how many of you use a calendar to like let you know what things you're gonna be doing during the day? How many of you make a to-do list? How many of you play certain music in the background? How many of you know when you're getting too stressed that you can stand up and walk away and take a breath? How many of you have visual, right? We all use supports. So why are we like not letting that happen for our learners, right? So um, the CERTS model has really a really great list of transactional supports that could be looked at. There's lots of resources just in general and like disability studies around how to accommodate and provide more support to learners. And I think we need to be more open as a field and understanding that it's okay to have supports in place for people that are struggling because we all use them. <laughs> so why we would expect someone to do something perfectly without supports when we rely on supports ourselves is beyond me. Now, if there's a concern for whatever reason that like the support that's initially needed is not um, transferable, it won't realistically exist in most environments, and then that could be more dangerous for the learner, then you can use shaping to help fade out the support to a level that is more reasonable. Um, but it is something that I think we need to make sure we're being flexible around. I want to jump in. I think oftentimes we, in our maybe not our field, but I oftentimes see people using those kinds of supports as motivators and maybe we should rethink that and reframe them as not as motivators, but as supports and visual cues. So like I don't use a to-do list to motivate me to do the to-do list, right? Like the to-do list is there to function, to remind me of the things I need to get done for my work day to get paid. And the motivator is finishing the job and getting paid, yeah. <laughs> right? I, but I oftentimes see like a class schedule you know, it's like, well, every kid with autism or every autistic person needs a schedule, right? They, they require them to be motivated to engage in their day. And I think the discrimination between those two things is really important that it's not a motivator. It is, it is actually a support to remind someone of what is, what is coming, what to expect, um, and not to force them to be motivated to complete the activity. Yep. Yeah. Perfect. Um, and Kaylin said there's also a difference between adding a token economy just because and not allowing a client to have a visual schedule that they've asked for and helps them stay on track, right? Um, and I've definitely, I've seen it, you know, go both ways where it's like people will add supports that aren't actually supports. They're just things that um, autistic children are supposed to benefit from, but they've not done any assessment to see if that actually does benefit them. Um, so, yeah. I'm not going to dive in on this too much more. I don't know, Hillary, if there was anything you wanted to say about response requirements, or I think those are pretty well covered in the process. So I have one last piece here, just one, you know, one more cute video of my son, because why not? Um, so with the, the three steps to compassion example with him, he has, you know, he's five now when I they took this video, he was four. 
And um, I've just seen as a mom, like how he goes through his different developmental milestones. And this is another thing I think isn't focused en enough on in our field. The fact that like humans do go through phases and as much as we want to think our science is powerful and strong, those phases are going to happen. Doesn't matter what you do, right? Like now how you react to them could make them worse or better, but they're still going to initially go through those phases, right? And we need to be open to understanding that and like working with that. Um, so when I'm with the, the three steps to compassion with him, the developmental milestones helped me identify, especially like what are skill deficits for this age and what's interesting to me. And it's like, I know it's going to sound bad to say this as a doctoral level behavior analyst, but Google is amazing sometimes, right? So like, I won't look at what to expect for his age, but then he'll start doing certain things. And then I Google it. And then I find all of these research articles and parenting resources that are like, yes, a five-year-old does X, Y, and Z. And I'm like, son of a... <laughs> oh, okay. Great to know that now, right? Um, but I don't want to like, I, the reason I look it up after the fact is I don't want to know ahead of time and then sort of like have a bias on it, right? And like expect it. Um, but every single time he's had certain things happen, when I look them up, it's like, yep, that's what you can expect for this age, whether it's one, two, three, four, five. Um, but what's interesting though, is like how things can shift. So like he had difficulty with transitions, obviously when he was two, but now that he's five, he is also again, having difficulty with transitions. And that is also a thing that five-year-olds have difficulty with, but for different reasons, right? So being able to, um, to kind of just recognize that there's like, even if it was a skill deficit that you addressed and like accounted for, it could also come up again as a skill deficit for a different reason, right? depending on what's going on. Um, so a lot of the, the interactions that I have with him, I provide supporting and coaching based on his skill deficits. And I'll start there. So when he was learning how to tolerate no, or we were learning about transitions, I would prep him ahead of time as much as possible. When the thing was actually presented, I would coach him through it and, you know, label for him, like Hillary was saying, and just sort of talk about like what our options were. But I also shift as he shifts. So if in that moment, he's allowing me to coach him and like work through it. We do that. If he starts escalating and shows that he is just beyond help at that point, then I give him space. And I'm just like, when you're ready, I'm here and, and ready for you. Right. So it's not, again, me like trying to force him as he's escalating through something and like not letting him have that experience. It's just like, you do you. And when you're ready, uh, we'll work through this. Right. Cause again, never in the history of ever has anyone calmed down when told to calm down, you know? So like, why would a child do that? Um, then there, what's been also interesting to me is how much planned interactions we've had to have around like his current motivations. And you'll see this in the video. What I mean is he's a, one of those kids who like loves dramatic, like, don't you dare chase, like all of that kind of stuff play. And if I don't get enough of that in with him throughout the day, he will make it happen. And he will make it happen by defying me <laughs> when I present like a routine thing, like go to bed um, or get dressed or even to do something preferred. Let's go outside and ride your garbage truck, right? Like he will make that happen if I am not satiating those uh, motivations throughout the day. He doesn't initiate it with me though. Like he likes the thing. You would think he would just initiate it, but to me, it's part of a skill deficit that's present. I have to initiate it with him. Um, now, and then when I do that, I label it and I talk about what we're doing and I give opportunities for him to request it so it can develop as a skill for him. But I think we often like, you know, man training is such a big thing in our field, but to, at least with my son, the way that we're taught language develops is not what actually happens. So like manding might be easier to be successful with and contrive situations, but when it comes to spontaneous communication, that is not necessarily what's happening. Like there, it's, it seems like, and this is just my own observation, the, um, that high motivation interferes with the communication piece. So when we're thinking about like stress responses, not that like being highly motivated is necessarily a stress response, but it is, um, creating a different physiological reaction in something, someone, if you've ever wanted something really badly, right? Like your physiological state in that moment is way different. I'm sure you all, even while we've been on tonight, 
have had moments where you're just so excited you're at a loss for words. Yes, you've all had those experiences. So why would we not think the same thing is going to happen for our kids? So like if they're so motivated for something and want something so badly, and then we're expecting them to initiate asking for it when that might not be a skill that they have yet. And we have to be ready to like present that to them. I've just been floored by how much of that and the practice has to happen because I'm a busy mom and I don't have time to practice these things. And I'm like, you don't, why, why do I have to actually teach you this stuff? Like, shouldn't it just happen? <laughs> Especially if I, if I know the function and I never give you the thing um, based around the function, like, shouldn't you just magically learn this stuff? No, it's not that simple, right? It's so much more involved than that. So, um, Hillary said Chomsky versus Skinner. Okay, we're almost done. We've gone, we went down from like 90 people to I think we're probably at like 50 at this point. Okay, so this is just one of his things over COVID was this like argumentative piece. So he was just highly motivated by like arguing with me about stuff. And sure enough, when I looked that up, apparently that's a thing four-year-olds like to do. So, um, so what I had to start doing then throughout the day was pick arguments with him. But I would do it over fun things stuff so that when I needed him to put on his shoes or brush his teeth or do whatever, he would already have had that interaction with me and he'd be more likely to just do the thing. If I didn't put this in enough with him, when it was time to do something that he really needed to do, he would pick the argument himself at that point, right? So this is just a video of me picking an argument with him. Hey, what are we going to have for breakfast? Nothing. Nothing? Oh, so I can eat all that bacon? No. It's all my bacon. But not no more. You have one piece of bacon. No way. I'm going to eat it all. It's all for me. <laughs> it's all for Jay. It is? How's he going to eat all our bacon? I'm having all the bacon for Jay. No way. It's mine. No, no way. It's <laughs> mine. For Jake. He didn't actually want the bacon, I don't think. <laughs> but he was going to give it to Chase. You know, the Paw Patrol dog. Um, okay, so you can just see, like, in that moment, like, I could have gone a million ways with that, but I was just, like, playful and, and you know, had a little argument with him. Um, let me do this. Okay, so this is my contact info. I'm going to put a link to the um, presentation in the chat so you can have the PDF of this. And then I'll also repost the information if you want, if anybody needs the 30% off to join the collective. But Hillary, did you have any thoughts about those like last few slides? Because I didn't really pause there. Taylor's voice is adorable. <laughs> Also, I, my son's about to be six and I can so relate. I mean, I, I think we talked about this a little, we've talked about this quite a bit, but yeah. No, I don't have much to relate to, to add except for in the SBT portion of this, I think um, it's really important to remember non-contingent reinforcement. Kaylin talked about this too, right? Like that's really what you're providing as a non-contingent schedule of the availability of those things so that the battle doesn't have to be picked when it's really an important battle. And I think we talk about this in the group a lot, like pay attention to attention and notice what kind of attention your learner wants and provide it non-contingently. Keep that bucket or that cup really full so that it's kind of always running over. So when you really can't pick a battle, you don't have to pick a battle because you've picked it over things that don't actually matter. Yeah. I could watch videos of Taylor with that cute little voice like all day though it just makes my heart really happy sorry I thought I had the link like readily available but I have to pull it up um yeah I don't think he sounds like that anymore though Aww. I don't think so either they grow so fast I know don't need another one though I'm good <laughs> I don't know I my I'm really enjoying five almost six it's been like a I feel like I haven't had this much of air in my life since 18 months old. So I'm really enjoying it. And my daughter is so different. Like it is such a different ball game. People are like the terrible threes. And I'm like, this is nothing compared to the last three years of my son. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. It is interesting. Like as much as I try not to do anything around like gendered stuff, like the consistent differences that I've seen for my friends that have girls versus boys, um, 
my, actually, while we were doing this presentation, my one friend, Samantha, was sent me a message. I haven't watched it yet, but she's like, watch this video. It's a perfect example of the difference between boys and girls because she has a five-year-old girl and a two-year-old boy. And it's just been like um, very interesting for her to experience the difference in how they engage with stuff. Um, I think I think we can recognize, I, I, I'm going to go for this anyway, even though it's not necessarily related. I think we can recognize that people can have um, uh, gendered identities that don't match what is on their bodies, but know that physiologically those hormones are still happening in the body, right? So like physiologically, somebody who is, we're recording and I just want to like model sex positive language. So physiologically, somebody who has a vulva versus a penis is going to engage, like experience hormones differently and experience development differently just because of how the brain if we're going to talk about neuroscience, right? Like the brain chemicals and the neuroscience between how those hormones interact with development and physiological development are different. Even if a person in a body that has a penis recognizes themselves as a, as a woman or as a girl, I think we can recognize those two things both being true at the same time. So while I also really struggle with the idea of not gendering kids, I also think it's really important for us to recognize that physiologically people who have different hormones and different developmental brains experience and go through life in different ways. Um, and so people who are born with a penis or people who are born with a vulva are going to experience their development, neuro, neuro development and physiological development differently. So here we are back at Rye, but I also, I'm listening to this book by Maggie Dent and I love her so much. And it's really hard for me because I grew up in this era of like, anyone can be anything. I was the most tomboy girl ever. And I was like, don't tell me I'm any different than the boys that I'm wrestling just because I have a vulva. And it turns out that we actually know that there are developmental differences between um, people who have a penis and people who have a vulva. So glad we're recording that. We might want to cut it later. <laughs> well, you'll have the copy of the recording to do whatever you want with Hillary. <laughs> That was a wonderful explanation though. I haven't heard it explained so well. Um, so I appreciate Thanks. that. And thank you for sharing. Did um, There was a question that came up that I didn't address yet. So I'm just going to talk about this. It ties back into the podcast episode that um, Hillary and I did. I mentioned in there, like, I didn't really do a whole lot of research on like how to be a parent before I had Taylor, because I was like, I've been a behavior analyst for 10 years. I've got this stuff down. Good. Um, and and I didn't, <laughs> but you know, whatever. Um, but so like the only book I really read was Glenn Latham's po uh, The Power of Positive Parenting. And in when I was reading it the whole time, I was like, oh, I want, you know, Taylor's dad to read like X, Y, and Z um, on this. But there were pieces of it that like, as I was reading it, I was like, mm, I don't know about that. And I think if I reread it now, there'd probably be a whole lot of stuff I would be like, not so thrilled about mostly again, from understanding like my experiences with my own son and then what Hillary has exposed um, and like taught me about relating to like rye parenting and things like that. But um, the question was basically like, what was it? I honestly don't know. I read the book like six years ago and I have mom brain and I just can't tell you <laughs> what the specific sections were. I just remember at the time I was like, it was definitely something about extinction. It was probably something about following through. There may have, may have been some cry it out type stuff in there, um, but there were just definitely for me, like some harsher, like that are commonplace, like behavior analytic things that happen. But like for, from my own experience in the field, I was like, oh, we won't be doing that. Um, but I don't remember what they were. <laughs> so that's my honest answer on that one. Um, did anybody else have any thoughts or questions? I know we're past the like original time that we set, but. So much for that 30 to 45 minutes, huh? I know. Well, I could have just gone through the slides and we could have not chatted, but um, it's better that way. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to go ahead and stop recording.